All right. Um, I want to welcome everyone to uh, How Can Access to AI Resources Support Human Rights? Uh, I'm Ben Brody, a senior reporter focusing on policy at Protocol, and I did shine my head for this. <laughs> a lot of you here probably believe that getting AI right is the great tech policy challenge of the next 10 years. We have some advantages in this project. We've gone through enough technological change to understand that the benefits of AI absolutely must be shared as widely as possible, and that the downsides for human rights can be real if we're not careful. In many ways, it's the perfect moment for this panel. The White House is leading a task force right now to determine the shape of the National AI Research Resource. NAIR is designed to provide computing power, data, education, and more to spur the development of AI in the U.S. The task force's recommendations for the shape of NAIR are due within months this year, and the administration is also putting together an AI Bill of Rights. Members of Congress from both sides of the aisle have urged these two initiatives to go hand in hand. The question now is, how should the U.S. seek to build AI that lifts up people of all races and ethnicities, regions and ages, abilities and experience? How can it help people live free, prosperous and self-guided lives? And how can people from all backgrounds get access to the potential benefits of AI? The future can perhaps be as exciting as revitalized communities that have suffered for decades from redlining or the loss of manufacturing jobs, but it can also be as dire as any repressive sci-fi oligarchy you can imagine, perhaps. If I've made it sound enough like an MCU trailer, then I guess we're ready to start. Uh, we're going to take uh, audience questions at the end, but for now, uh, I have uh, Asad Ramzanali. He's legislative director for Congressman, Congresswoman Anna Eshu, who co-authored the NAIR Task Force Act. Um, Devaki Raj is uh, founder and CEO of Crowd.ai, which specializes in no-code computer vision. Tom Dawson uh, is CEO of Proof Systems, which focuses on AI identity management. And Austin Carson is the head of the newly founded nonprofit Seed AI. Welcome all. Uh, Asad, I wanted to start with you. Um, this is a letter from a boss, a, a quote from a letter your uh, boss recently wrote. Uh, Smart individuals with good ideas should not need to work at a handful of large technology companies to have access to the computer power or other resources needed to research and deploy AI-based technologies. Uh, what were the concerns behind that letter, and what's the worry that this isn't being carried out? Yeah, so th thank you for doing this, and, and we're excited to be here for this. Uh, so the NAIR, the National AI Research Resource, which is a mouthful, uh, the idea is captured in that thesis. The idea is that there's going to be a lot of gains from society that come from advances in artificial intelligence in the coming years. We're already seeing that. But we need to democratize who has access to be able to do that. Right now, it's concentrated in a few companies that can afford the inputs, which I think of as data, compute power, and expertise. There's really just a handful of company, companies in the world who can do that. We need universities, we need nonprofits, we need others at the table to also be contributing to that foundational thought and research, but also the gains, to your point. Uh, we want to bring the rest of the panel in here. Uh, can you guys talk about what uh, small businesses and research institutions can bring to the table to make sure that those benefits go wide um, and that are maybe things that those biggest companies uh, can't bring? Well, that's a tough one. I'm looking at my two colleagues are looking at me here, so uh, I, yeah, I can kick off. You can kick off? Go ahead. Wait, are we working? Are we working? I don't think. I'll talk loudly until the mic works just for a good. So the funny thing is that the things I'm going to quote actually are things that I've heard from David Key and Tom, <laughs> which is uh, I think you see a lot of ambition and a lot of willingness on the part of dynamic startups, especially those that are focused on access and on making things more approachable and more easy to work with and build upon. Um, and they're working with community colleges, with research, with not just research institutions, but partnerships between research institutions and some up and coming institutions um, and all across the country. And I'd love to hear you talk about it more, but it was powerful. Fair enough, thank you. Um, so at Crowd AI, we built this no-code computer vision tool. Um, essentially, we enable anyone, regardless of technical background, to be able to build their own computer vision. Um, 
As a small company, we started building best-in-class computer vision for a lot of the major flagship DoD AI projects out there. And what we realized was that um, a lot of this technology, again, was in the hands of very few, you know, either Silicon Valley startups, academic institutions, or very large, um, uh, deeply technical companies. Um, so over the last two years, we built this platform and we started to think about how to get it in the hands of as many people as possible. Um, so in parallel, what we did was we opened up a platform and created academic partnerships with uh, universities like Gallaudet University, Howard University, uh, James Madison, JHU, um, Texas A&M, and then as part of OSTP, they're doing something around community college education programs, and we've signed on a pledge to allow our platform to be used by community colleges. But ultimately, what we are trying to say is that in order for AI to go beyond R&D um, and into the hands of as many people as possible, you need to arm the next generation of the workforce with an understanding of what AI is. They don't need to be AI experts, but they need to be able to be subject matter experts in their own industry or their own workflow um, to be able to then not be out of a job in a couple of years, but to essentially inform the way AI is improving their own kind of kind of working, whether it be in industry or in other in other areas. Tom, did you? Yeah, I'll piggyback just a little bit on that because I think what you said is is uh, true and, and quite impressive. I'm looking. I'm going to look at this a little bit from the other side. Um, you know, um, Proof Systems is focused um, primarily on visual systems and also audio systems in terms of AI. Um, we um, do facial recognition, voice recognition, you name it, it goes on. We do it all together in form of video and, and whatnot. Uh, a lot of that's going on, a lot of it's interesting, a lot of it's uh, important. But what we've seen is that there's not been real access to the communities um, that are out there in general, particularly communities of color, women, and, and, and the like. And I always like to pull it back over to that question because we are talking about workforce, but we're also talking about inequities in terms of access to these kinds of tools or this kind of knowledge in general. One of the conversations my colleagues and I had a little while back was that, hey, look, you know, I've got friends whose kids are already starting to think about age six, seven, think about AI. They're thinking about com computers. They're thinking about how to think around computers. But we've got an entire world of individuals who don't even understand some of the basic concepts around it. And so if you're talking about things like our education and bringing dollars in that way, or if you're talking about the workforce, how do you get them even to be, begin to think about those questions? And so I think part of what we're talking about, particularly in terms of human rights, which you know, you're talking about directing resources in a, in a certain way, you're talking about getting folks to think about these questions now. And you're talking about directing resources in a way that gets them to think about these sorts of questions right now. So what does AI mean to all of us? Um, you know, there are lots of different kinds of ways of thinking about this machine learning, there's you know, the, the deep learning, you name it. Folks don't know much about it. Um, I happen to know a little bit about it. I've got an economics background and whatever. I've got friends. We've worked hard at it. We've developed algorithms. We've done some really interesting work. But how many of me, you, any of the folks in this panel, do there actually exist out there thinking about these questions? And so you look at America right now. Um, um, you look at AI. About 2% of folk can really do this stuff, they say, in the world. Well, in order for us to really reach our full potential, at least in this country, we need to think about how, more, how to be successful reaching out to that broader population of individuals that often don't look like some of my colleagues who've gone to Stanford or, or MIT or the like. We need to be able to reach out. And so part of what I think NAIR is about is making sure those, research, you know, those resources reach deep down into those communities like, for example, um, Alabama State University, who we've reached out to and, and begun working with in this way, those HBCUs, for example. And I'll stop right there. But. No, I, I, I think that's a perfect uh, jumping off point because I said I want to uh, kind of punt it back to you. A, a lot of the uh, NAIR funding is going to live at the National Science Foundation, which of course, you know, does tremendous work on funding the, the most cutting edge scientific research at our best research universities. Um, is that uh, sufficient to go through the breadth of community college, even high school, HBCUs, uh, worker retraining that the panel is talking about here? Yeah, so the, to kind of step back for a second, the timeline of things is Congress passed a law that directed the NSF, the National Science Foundation, along with the OSTP, 
to come to establish which is part of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Thank you for checking the acronyms that often lose people in these kind of panels. Um, the they're, they're supposed to put a task force together to figure out questions like where should it live? What should the funding model look like? What's a sustainable model? And so I, I think that's a fair question. The NSF has, since World War II and its founding, been about basic research. I think what we're talking about is more than that. We're talking about applications. We're talking about translational research. We're talking about other pieces of the innovation life cycle. Um, I, the task force is supposed to figure out those types of questions. And I think they're, at least from what we can tell, you know, not looking at the recommendations yet, I think they're grappling with those kinds of questions. Yeah, and then part of what I've read as part of the NAIR is like the education piece is going to be really important. Um, but it's not just about what is AI, but it's educating any type of person that's going to be contributing into the workforce about like how AI could potentially be part of their the, the jobs that are going to be taking in the future. So what, what does that mean exactly? Right now, a lot of AI, there's a lot of training associated with it for a port, one type of deep learning. Um, and a lot of those jobs are being now brought overseas. And these are kind of low barrier to entry jobs. I think part of the NAIR could be, how do you bring these jobs back over to the US um, to create training data for all these new types of industries that are going to be relying on AI? Um, so I think that there's a lot of work to be done, not just bringing, you know, cutting edge technology and funding cutting edge technology, but also translating these resources to a lot of people that don't want to be left behind when AI takes a larger place in, you know, today's workforce and industry. Yeah, and one thing I think about a lot, and one of the main reasons that I actually started Seed AI is because you want to see people get the economic benefit, you want to see people's communities benefit from what they create, um, but I really want to see as much agency as possible coming from each community, especially any that's likely to be disproportionately impacted throughout the entire process, throughout the process of creating very foundational technology that does require a ton of resources, through the process of creating the applications on top of that, and on top of that, it's going to become like component-based software like we have right now. And I don't want that XKCD topic or comic of like the one piece from a guy in Nebraska in 2007, except for that piece is super racist. You know what I mean? Like that's in the world scenario. Uh, I hope everybody uh, in this room knows that comic. If not, we should find a way to put it on the resources because that's uh, classic. Um, Austin, talk about the geographic component of that where it's not just, um, you know, communities that have historically been marginalized. You know, we don't just want, um, you know, communities in Baltimore and Washington and New York, even if they have been historically marginalized, to be the benefits of that. So talk about the geographic component. Yeah, I think there's two sides of it. The first is it's not just the geographic distribution of the resources themselves. It's the geographic distribution of the users of those resources, right? And it's, you know, you certainly have kind of socioeconomic, you know, racial, societal factors that are at play and are part of the consideration of this in terms of access and particularly in like proportionality and representation. But the same can be said if you're looking at the competitiveness of the United States writ large for the different skills and the different challenges of every state in the nation, right? Like there is this predominant idea that if you're going to bring in good AI talent or a good AI application, it's going to come from where the AI stuff is. But we need to move towards it's going to come from where the everything else stuff is, right? We have all of this great technology being developed, but we're going to hit a wall as long as it's focused upon again, the interests of a fairly small set, both economically and socially. And so the geographic distribution, it's gonna follow what's called the EPSCOR program, which means that the states that get a very small percentage of NSF funding uh, will get a prioritization of like 20% of the funding that's gonna come out, assuming that that funding comes from, you know, some of this make it here uh, legislation that's gonna come down. But the NAIR itself requires an across the, Amer across the country approach. Um, like I said, it's about strengths and it's about challenges. It's not about doing anybody a favor, right? It's about getting people to the point where that contribution and competitiveness flows across the country. Can, can I add on to that for a second? So the geographic component, uh, my boss is Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. She represents much of Silicon Valley where the companies were trying to democratize, uh, where the concentration exists, right, of, of AI resources. Um, our view has been generally that 
the democratization, even geographically, outside of Silicon Valley, is a great thing for the country, but also for our district. If you want to see Silicon Valley startups thrive, you want them to partner with all of the resources and the humans and the intelligence that are available across the country, but across the world. And so that's how we think about that question as well, is that's a kind of rising tide situation. You know, I, I do want to say just a little bit here about uh, this, uh, piggybacking on what you've said, uh, Carson. Um, assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. What are the assumptions? You talk about the, the bias assumptions. One of the things that we struggled with at early on is um, I remember early in our research, um, we published a couple of things on it, uh, looking at the ability to recognize people of color, uh, women in particular. And folks, I think it was like 80%. It was horrible at the time when we looked at some of the base programming that was going on. And again, it was about the assumptions. But the people who were making the assumptions, developing the AI at the time, you know, you got teams like ours that are fairly diverse, made up of different kinds of people. But many of these teams aren't. And, and it's not that they're doing something necessarily on purpose. It's that that's who they went to school with. Or that's who's in their community. They happen to be in Boston. I mean, I met one of my best friends in the world in this space in Boston. But the reality is that the assumptions are implied in the product. They're in that product. And we need to begin to think about that. People think that when, I like to say my zero and one people, you know, I'm an economics kind of guy. Our zero and one folks, they think, you know, they may not recognize um, any, you know, they don't see it. They're not that they're not trying to. I remember the, the, the statement that came out about, was it two and a half years ago, maybe three, before the sort of big fallout we saw in the newspapers when the, um, um, a certain, um, um, well, anyway, I don't want to get too political on this one. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is this. Uh, before the big fallout about identification of individuals online, uh, came and we talked about um, sort of the gender and race bias. There really was no recognition of it. They just simply said, we can't do it. And small companies like ours that began to look at these different types of questions said, that's not true. We can do it, but the resources and the energy put toward it wasn't there. NAIR, I think, is in part a response to it. And, uh, yeah, let me give a specific example. So the reason we think that workforce development is really important is the more types of people you get building computer vision models or natural language processes models or tabular data models, then you get a more diversity of thought. So what, let me give you two specific examples. The first is, you know, right now if you have footage of brown people carrying guns, right, and you're, a lot of your data is trained on brown people carrying guns, then a model that suddenly sees on a new data set a person that's not brown carrying a gun, then it's probably less likely to find it, right? But if a if a diverse workforce um, builds models, they, they understand the assumptions that you know, some examples may not follow, right? So then you're, you're thinking about what are the assumptions you're making when you create the training data necessary in order to build a model. Similarly, this is a much more known use case, which is for financial data, right? Um, for them to build a model based on understanding a loan application, right? They would take a lot of socioeconomic data because that's historically they would do it based on who would get the loans. So if you look at historical data on who gets the loans, then it's gonna put a lot of people with certain backgrounds out of that process. And so if you're building these machine learning models that does it automatically, then again, you're biasing who gets these loans. So as part of kind of the thesis of workforce development, diverse development, and part of education around um, putting resources to the NAIR or into education of more diverse workforce, then you're getting different diverse people solving these problems, not just for me, this is how the data looks like, this is where my data comes from, but like, how do we make sure the data reflects best the population or the problems you're trying to solve? Um, what do you need from government? What, what does Assad need to go back to the Hill and, and tell them to do? Uh, so there's the education and the workforce component of ethical uses of AI, particularly in high-risk situations, let's say facial recognition. Um, what do you need from the government to make that work better? Well, I can talk about specifically as a small business, right? So if you actually look at the way funding is being spent on AI, um, it's primarily focused on a lot of the big prime contract contractors, right? So a small business, even though, you know, for example, this, it could be a woman-owned small business or something like that, um, you, de you generally won't get access to those dollars and access to those contracts because there's a lot of different types of regulations in terms of getting contracts in the first place. So what's really open to us is either um, you've got 
people that are really excited about bringing in Silicon Valley technology and making it commercially licensable within the government, which is much more rare, or you have to go the approach of an SBIR. Um, and SBIRs have been known to not convert into programs of record, and like the conversion rate is ex vanishingly small, right? So part of what we need from the government is more resources around bringing small businesses rather than people being comfortable with incumbents that are very large prime contractors that they're easy to, that they understand how to do business with um, as part of opening up the resources for the NAR outside of very large businesses that have a lot of obviously large lobbying power, et cetera. Um, Asad, talk a little bit about whether um, I, it's all well and good to ha kind of have a philosophy like, yeah, this really needs to be broad-based. We want this to be broad-based. What steps do you think can, should, will be taken um, to make sure that it actually is, that we don't just say like, well, we opened it up, but yeah, all those people with those big lobbyists, they just kind of happen to one. It's really a surprise. Yeah, I think there's two parts to your question. And I think the first is actually the question you asked at the beginning that I didn't answer <laughs> of why the letter came to be. Um, so, so, and I didn't, I wasn't trying to avoid it. I just uh, <laughs> went on a different tangent. Um, I'm generous, but persistent. I appreciate it. Uh, you're, you're good at your job. So the, uh, the reason the letter came to be is there are, uh, we were talking about this earlier, there's a bunch of efforts across government that are basically dealing with AI, right? There's the cloud of like something, something AI. Um, the NAIR, we, we worked on, we're, we're very invested in, we're following closely. There's another, and, and that's seen as the, like, how do we make sure we're competitive as the economy starts to depend on AI? How do we make sure that we have a broader base of who can contribute to and benefit from that? There are other efforts to think about how the downsides of AI, the bias issues, uh, the, the labor force displacement issues, all those kinds of things, those are other conversations happening. The letter came to be to say, we need to bring those together. If we're going to make AI research dollars available for other types of entities, we shouldn't then ask them to think about all those problems 10 years later. It should be baked into the first layer of it. When the task force is figuring out what NAIR is, how do we even think about access to resources? That's where we should be thinking about bias. That's where we should be thinking. So in the statute that created the task force, there's a specific provision that says you need to think about privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, you need to give us an assessment of that. How should we design that at the initial layers of this program? So that's kind of how we think about that one part of it. The second thing I think you're getting at is uh, questions of who's actually going to deploy the NAIR. If this is a research cloud, there will be entities that can, actually, that can actualize that right, and make that available. Uh, there are cloud players out there. There are also many examples in government where government itself built the infrastructure. Uh, our general view is that part of the thesis of this thing is that there is a concentration in the AI research space. It, this effort to lower the concentration shouldn't worsen the concentration. Uh, when you look at the efforts to build government infrastructure, in our view, that's a better long-term solution. Now, can you get that off the ground tomorrow? No. Uh, and I think NAIR has got to grapple with those equities of how do you think about those two pieces of the coin, or the task force does. And I'll be curious to see where they come out. Do I have my own biases, and do I think that there are trade-offs? Yeah. So we're thinking about that as well. And I'm going to push back here, which is the NAIR, the, the, the council that was built to put the NAIR together is primarily large businesses and academic institutions. Um, I think there's only one small business represented there. Um, so it's kind of, it's... It's still continuing to think about all the different players that will eventually be involved in the actual rollout of the NAIR outside of just kind of theory and letter writing, right? There's I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's totally fair. And I think that's where these, um, the pressure that comes from people calling out what, different, what happens at different steps, that's a good thing. We should be voicing, hey, is this right? Is this how this should look? And we should be gut checking it at every level. So I think that's right. Yeah, and I'll give the, the NAIR task force a little bit of like a moderating comment on that, but I do understand and agree with the concern. Um, I think watching the task force meetings, they have been eminently serious, at least. Yeah. Um, and there was a letter earlier on in the administration with folks calling for a little bit of more of attention at OSDP for representation and on civil rights issues. And I think if you've watched the NAIR task force meetings, there is a very good faith effort that's been made on that front. Um, and I will say that to the original question of like, you know, how are we going to make sure this ends up going the right way? There's two things about it. First is 
there have been, again, pretty good serious conversations about setting up, like, here are some governance bodies. Here's who we need to make sure we have in the room. Second thing is, I mean, that's my job, right? That's your job. That's all of our job. That's Assad's job. I mean, this is an incredible opportunity, and it would be a terrible, terrible shame if it got tanked because we couldn't really think about just, okay, how can we agree that it should work the way that it should work? You know, and the second piece is, there's a lot of kind of public-private opportunity to be had here between the entities that are kind of like Tom and David here representing, right, in addition to the folks that build the hardware and do the training and all those things for local academic systems. Because what the NAIR is ultimately going to be, you know, as is drawn out in a really excellently complicated graph on the most recent task force meeting slides, which Chandler in particular should check out. I know you want to look at it. You're going to love it. It's going to be connective tissue with, a, again, ideally, as stated in temp by this task force, it's going to be connective tissue between a bunch of different existing federal and like allocated otherwise resources, much like Exceed is, but at a much larger scale with an easier access point. Um, and so I think that opens you into, again, you're going to address the geographical component. You're going to address some of the socioeconomic components. You're going to have specific intentional allocation for it's is a public-private resource. It should be used for a public good. And we know for a fact that you don't have the time and you don't have the GPU hours to sit and, like, sim out with somebody everything that could possibly happen. And that's part of the beauty of you having a marketplace and opening things up. At the same time, it's all the more need for there to be a step built into everybody's marketplaces, right, mm -hmm. that runs it through a let's make sure this isn't going to accidentally do anything terrible, especially as we get to the larger, more complex, more abstracted types of transformer networks that are going to open up that surface even further. So it's an opportunity as foundational movement is happening to set it on as straight as a field was, as we can without making too many Again, even personally biased decisions, me trying to think what I think is good for everybody else sitting here isn't going to work. In the early days of Clubhouse, and I'll move on because I can see you're about to yank me, I was on a chat with this guy, and he was going on. He was kind of like a, well, I'm not going to say that. Anyways, he was going on and saying that he didn't think that it was necessarily important to have representation because he can, like, put himself in people's shoes and think about it. <laughs> and I lost it a little bit. I wasn't proud of it. I said a lot of language I won't say here, but I was pretty upset. But I'm like, no, you can't. Anyways, that's that was my motivating. No, <laughs> I want I want a recording I, of that. I am going to say something. I have to jump in here very Please. very quickly. But this is an important point that you've made. One of the things that we need to remember right now. We're talking about, in this world, 2% of people being able to do this stuff, period. And of that, we're talking about a fraction of that being willing to focus on this question. Again, it's not just a work shortage, you know, workforce issue. It's not just a community. It's a survival issue for this country to be able to compete successfully with the rest of the world. We're not just talking about China. We're not just talking about India. We're not just talking... This is a competition question that we need to ask ourselves honestly and make it agnostic both politically and racially. Why? Because it's the only way we succeed in this world and continue to be competitive. You think about this. Everyone likes to use uh, African Americans as the poster child of bad behavior when it comes to drugs, for example. That's a reality. We know that. Any TV show you look at, whatever the first people you look at there, maybe they're trying to do a little bit different. But let's think about this. And I've known a few folks who've come out of this space and then gone on and do other things in their lives and do better. These are really, really smart people playing with numbers and situations every day. Why are we not focused on how to pull them out of their settings and put them in a different direction where their lifelong earning potential cannot just be the same as, but be above what it is that they might make in those professions. Why is that not being championed? And it's because of this sort of disposition that, hey, I can sit myself in the shoes of this individual who happens to be in front of certain kinds of social changes and social challenges. Now look, I'm the wrong person to talk about this. My life is fairly damn privileged, I'll be honest. I have not had the same challenges that some folks have had, but I've had access to talk to individuals who've been in these situations. And I am saying we are somehow missing the point. If we don't get right back to what you've been talking about, how do we encourage folks to be in the work, get, get into this workforce? How do we expose them? If they don't know, they don't know. And if they don't know, they don't do. And guess what? If they don't do, we all lose. That's where we are in terms of competition in this world today. 
Uh, I just want to take this question just sort of straight down the panel. I, I want to talk a little bit about vendor responsibility uh, for these high-risk uses. Uh, how should we think about what, what NAIR should be doing about, uh, about vendor responsibility and, and the potential, uh, you know, if you talk about facial rec recognition, the potential misuses of not the actual vendors but whoever they sell the tools to? And then from, from the actual vendor point of view, what are the things you think through? I mean, you know, you're, you're actually doing computer vision. So let's just kind of go down the panel that way. I think there's, at, at the level of abstraction of like in general, how should you think about vendors and vendors, vendors, if you will, third and fourth parties? I do think that, especially when the government is involved, there's a level of diligence that's required for not just, we, I think we do a reasonable job at questions like security, but I think we have to do a better job at questions like equity Question, uh, questions of bias. Uh, and, and I say better because we're not starting from zero, right? The people who are making these decisions are thinking about these questions. But when you look at the recent, uh, the IRS clear view, or the IRS IDME situation, right? Uh, that's one of those things where like, what was, like, what was the equity thinking ahead of time? <laughs> and it wasn't none, right? I, I'm not trying to sit here and bash the IRS. But I think there was a, what could we have done a little bit better? You can. I'm, I'm, I might want to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. Part of it, as a vendor, you think about what levels of um, kind of security does the end customer, i.e. the government, have on your AI, right? So a lot of computer vision, right, as a Silicon Valley company, you have to think about not everybody wants to do AI for the U.S. government um, when you think about hiring. So what are the things you're willing to do when you're not willing to do? And what are the things can you translate back to the company that, for example, the DOD does in to ensure that your AI isn't just going to potentially run amok? You know, part of it is just looking at a lot of DOD um, kind of core tenants, which is they won't just automatically use an AI without having humans in the loop making the final decision, right? So kind of making sure that the AI that you do isn't something that's just going to be immediately used for something without any kind of human interaction. Um, in parallel, right, as a small startup, there's things that we are going to do and we're not willing to do. Um, and that's something that we put together some AI guidelines and ethics that we, as a company, came together um, to put together. And, and that's something that we also have to continue grapple as a technology changes, as use case changes, as world affairs change as well. Um, so for us, it's more, it's very, it's a very complex problem that we actually have to grapple with every day. Well, you know, our company is also a small business like yours. Um, as a founder, I, with my other founders, we sat around and had lots and lots and lots of debates about how we're going to train our solution, how we're going to train this platform. And what we ended up doing in terms of AI, we have, you know, visual and audio, but the visual solution we realized we wanted to tweak. We did, we did not want to hold on to people's data, but this was an early on decision as opposed to not picking on IDME and others. But this was an early decision that we made. How do we want to train our solution? The notion that, for example, now I think it's coming into popularity now, the idea of being able to develop, which we did, uh, sort of a, a, a zero knowledge proof or zero knowledge protocol for taking in data and not holding the data, because you know, even the visual, it's still data. How do you use that data it became really important to us. And we had to actually, it was a financial decision. It, it cost us money, it cost us time, but it was ethically important to us in terms of what we were going to do. Now, I may not be saying all the things that my CTO and co-founder and partner might like me to say in terms of the right way, how to say this the right way. But the bottom line is up front, it was part of our thinking. Now, the question becomes when dealing with vendors, um, and others that we would like to you know, use or involve in our work, do they share our philosophical bent? I think that if, for example, the question about IDME and others hadn't become a big issue um, lately, I don't think people would have considered what we had been doing in terms of this approach to how you use the data or whether you can hold on to the data. Or People wouldn't have been thinking about it. Now they are, but they weren't thinking about it before. And that tells you something, that somehow we're disconnected from the concerns that folks have about privacy or the direction morally or ethically in this country, not saying that this was a moral question, there's a, dis there's a, dis there's a disconnect. 
And we, as creators, inventors, business people, small, we need to take the lead. This is the generation of change. This generation of folks right here in front of you, all these folks who are in this age bracket here, we know right and wrong, and we know the outcomes of bad decision making. We can make that change, and we can stand on our principles about what's right. You've done it. I've done it. We're all thinking about it. Uh, I'm going to open uh, the audience to question before Austin talks. So if you if you have one, raise your hand while Austin while Austin goes. All right, I'm like completely lost my train of thought. No, I would, so I would say the first thing is what, what folks have talked about here, which is think about it seriously, right? And from my experience, the vast majority of folks that I have talked to are thinking about it seriously. And if there is any impediment to them doing more work, it is ironically, given the nature of this conversation, resource-based. Yeah. That is often headcount-based and time-based and what you have to struggle to make these things happen, right? But to at least get to the point that, hey, if there were more resources, you'd be ready to dive in. I think the second thing is, if at all possible, to participate in things like the NIST risk management framework, the development of that. We talked about a number of different kind of federal and other uh, collaborative processes to develop some best practices or give some advice. Um, the willingness of everyone here, the desire to participate. And the same thing, I think, with making the relationships between yourselves and other community colleges and institutes and institutions that are not, again, currently that, you know, well represented or are not currently given the opportunity to engage and apply this stuff. Um, and then finally, just as a thing that we can do to support this in general, is just a risk, you know, an AI assurance ecosystem, doing everything that we can to support an ecosystem that can help in a neutral third way, like, you know, maybe be involved in some of these test beds that can work hand in hand with companies that are doing some more, you know, perhaps harm uh, exposed applications. All right, I'll, I'll just, I'll be the audience with the question. Um, talk about uh, the hype around AI. I did this in my intro. I talked about the Terminator, and I also talked about Paradise. Uh, are those, um, uh, how important is it to avoid the hype, particularly as you try to bring people into uh, either working in the space or, or, you know, using AI in a way to actually make their, uh, their lives better? We primarily focus on um, AI that is low-hanging fruit, right? How could you automate rote tasks that happen a lot, either on the manufacturing side, when you work with very large beer manufacturer, one of the largest roof tile manufacturers alongside the DOD, right? The, the sets of use cases are vast, vastly different, but ultimately it's thinking about there's multiple ways one can be engaged with AI. You could take the very... Uh, you know, 10,000 feet approach and build something extraordinarily deeply complicated from a research perspective like OpenAI, um, which has definitely has its place in this world and fundamentally will change the way we, we do work much more drastically than low-hanging fruit. But I do think over the next, you know, 10, 20 years, um, if you're going to get to that stage, you can't leave, again, the workforce behind. So how do you get them to be involved in the low-hanging fruit? How do you get them involved in um, where automation can, can improve their day-to-day life um, and then eventually kind of as AI continues to grow due to funding from the a NAIR to make sure that the U.S. remains on top of the research side, um, then people won't be left behind. So that's how we think about it. I think there's obviously a lot of hype and rightly so. There's incredible research coming out of both academia as well as the private sector um, and that research will continue to help the U.S. stay on top of, of us being, you know, research and science and technology leaders. Um, but there's a lot of non-sexy things one can do with AI right now. Um, and that's something that I think that there's, there's a lot of room for, for growth, both within the US government as well as in, in commercial. You have to think that when you think about Fortune 500 companies, the vast majority of them don't have access to the deeply technical talent of the FANG companies out there, right? Um, so you still gotta, you can't leave industry behind, right, as well, in the US, or it'll go overseas. I think. Uh, so I was going to say, I think, there's, I think there's a couple levels to this, right? One, one is what you're saying of, like, what, how do you actually apply this to things that are real-world issues with real-world humans that should be involved? And I think that's the right place to be thinking, and that's where a lot of the discussion has been, especially with NAIR, is it's really applications of, to your point earlier, like a couple of strands of machine learning and deep learning. Um, 
I, I also try to think about it at, at a different level. How is AI itself evolving? Because we are right now caught. I started with NAIR exists because you need a lot of data, a lot of compute, and a lot of expertise. What if you don't? Like, what, what are the next steps of AI? What is unsupervised learning? What are the next branches of AI that we're not developing yet? And so I don't think what, what we want to try to avoid with wherever NAIR goes is path dependency. Yeah. Right? We should invest in the applications of this technology, but we should also be thinking about what's next. Good. No, 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 no. no, no. The analyst. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what's scary as it is? We are already thinking about what's next. That's the interesting thing. I mean, we're, it, it's, I mean, you know, this, to use Terminator is a, a joke, but the reality is, is we are, what, what we're thinking about, what we're playing with right now, we need some responsible actors in the mix because creators create, and that's what I call, I, I think of the people, my team, and my, my best friend, I think of him as a, an artist. And frankly, he was an artist, you know. I mean, no, no, he plays like a million instruments, you know. He's just, you know, we sit around and toss ideas back and forth. And, you know, it, it, you know my wife and I said, you know, she's an artist, you know. These guys are artists. And so they just like to create. Now, getting them to focus in on something that's useful, but when you push them on a tangent, particularly when talk about visual systems or the like, their minds are just, how do we do more? We have to be aware of that. Um, it is scary. I mean, frankly, frankly, it is. It's scary. And I think in the next 10 years, um, we, we, we really, what we'll see in the next 10 years is going to be frightening. And the fact that there are more honor students in China working on issues than there are students that we've got in this country, uh, you know, not to be political here, I'm just throwing it out. Tom can't help every now and again, <laughs> but we still love him. We keep him around. <laughs> yes. um, I would say two things, one helpful, one unhelpful. So the first is I normally tell people, you know, talking about the pace of AI acceleration, talking about the pace of AI research, it's accelerating at like an unimaginable pace. It's completely bonkers, and I'll get into that after the helpful part. The helpful <laughs> part is even if AI technology froze today, and we didn't have any new research for just the next 10 years. We have 95% unexplored space in the, quote, boring stuff that David Key is talking about, where you can go and, and not the shit we talk about all day, every day, but in the just random stuff that makes life better for people across the country to apply what we already have and make. So now to the unhelpful part. It is getting completely insane, and it's about to get way completely insaner. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, <laughs> the, lack of, the lack of knowledge of that itself is somewhat dangerous, both to the point of anticipating the future needs of a system such as a national AI resource and explaining to policymakers and any other person exactly what's going on, right? I mean, I remember... You know, there's a couple really uh, capable generative technologies that came out that sparked real concerns about deep fakes is one thing, which we all probably remember. And then these systems called GPT-2 and GPT-3, which can generate text. And if certain, all of a sudden, GPT-3 gets sophisticated and large enough that it's a general system, which we always talked about never having a general system. It won't happen. It'll never happen. Because we thought of it as like a thing with a soul and not a thing that was generally productive and useful. Um, and all of a sudden, as soon as that happened, there was a no-code platform everywhere. There was, like, image generation. There was video generation. And since that happened, like, a year or two ago, <laughs> there have been six different, even bigger and crazier versions of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, hey, this is cool as hell. This is, like, one of the coolest things that has happened in technology ever. We made electricity that can, like have some slight maneuverability and thoughts and feelings about stuff that are a representation of ourselves, right? And yet, at the same time... We have to make sure that the next like two generations of this thing, we're going to have whatever it is that we kind of can't conceptualize yet as a true, independently productive, artificially intelligent machine. And I don't mean like I am robot, you know, walking around with I robot, I robot, I robot. Mm. not I am legend, way darker. <laughs> <But> I robot <laughs> walking around, but like there, if that those systems are a are a abstract representation of the humans involved in collecting, curating, and creating the data inside of them. Because, again, unsupervised learning on the rise is going to continue to be. Reinforcement learning, where stuff happens with, again, the machine kind of learning in a simulated environment or real environment or whatever. whatever. But we have to make sure those systems are built from the most broadly representative group of people yeah. possible, both so we have the best technology and so we don't have this massive internal social collapse. 
that seems like a pretty good place uh, to leave it. Uh, we appreciate you all uh, coming to this. Uh, stay here uh, for the keynote. It'll just be coming to you in the next few minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you all.